Well, good morning, Masters University, and welcome back. Uh, I know Johnny got to greet you on Monday. I did not. I hope your time away was fruitful, restful, um, that you had opportunity to uh, not only recover and reconnect, uh, but also impact and influence. You are light. You are salt. You have potency and potential wherever you go if you live as you are called to live as a Christ follower and as a kingdom citizen. So I hope it was fruitful. I hope these next weeks will be uh, productive for you and that you'll finish well. Um, I know you can feel a measure of pressure and responsibility that's uh, part of your maturing journey as you uh, prepare yourself for independence and adulthood. And so I hope it's fruitful and impactful. Well, I want to invite you to turn to James chapter 4. And um, Dr. Horner spoke to us on Monday and really began with this plain, blatant expression, you are in a theater. In your humanity, you're an expression of God's glory. The way he made you, the beauty that is housed in you as one made in his image, male and female, unique, beautiful by design. You may not feel beautiful, but you're the living expression of God's creativity. You're the apex of his creative handiwork. You've been entrusted with responsibility to not only populate the earth, but to give dominion over it. That's not a dead responsibility. That's a real-time stewardship of every man and woman. If you're a kingdom follower, you have a high trust and a great responsibility. You're in a theater to express his glory, not only by who you are by creation, but how you are by regeneration. You've been transformed. You've been changed. Validating your faith brings glory to God as you reveal what God has made you to be. The end game is to be Christ-like, to be like the firstborn, the first in rank, first in priority, the one who is above it all. We're to be like him in the way we represent him. We're not going to become God. We represent the quality and character of those changed by the grace of God. You're in a theater. It was interesting to me that we're promoting theater arts, which is a space where you can leverage your passions and creative capacities to bring glory to God, to honor Him, to allow people to see more of God than they saw before they witnessed your work on His behalf. I want to talk about representing God today in the theater of reality, community, in the world in which you live, in a way that magnifies His glory and validates your faith. Apologia is about strengthening your faith. I want to talk about what will damage your faith and destroy your influence. Apology is about not only defending it with words, but validating it with actions. And Johnny and I were talking about what I might speak to you about this morning, and I've been working at length and in detail on Sunday mornings at Grace and my fellowship group. Really the substance of the text that I hope to travel through this morning, because I don't know of any space more rich and relevant for you in terms of practical application to strengthen your faith by not destroying it, to grow your influence by protecting it. Because you can claim to be a Christian and not behave as a Christian. And that can be because you don't possess life change through the work of Jesus Christ. You say you have faith, but your life isn't changed by grace through faith. It's something you say, it's not something you possess. We talked earlier in this semester about assurance and knowing that you have it. And then one of the ways you know you have it is you validate it by the way you live it. Abraham was justified by his work. That does not mean he received righteousness. He validated his righteousness when he was willing to offer his only son. Rahab validated the righteousness she possessed because of the choices she made by faith to serve the servants of God, even at the threat of her own life. Faith works, or it is not genuine faith. 
And one of the threats, one of the challenges to the reality of your faith is the influence and the magnetic pull of the world in which you live in and the appetites that are placed in you, in your humanity, that have been impacted by the fall of Adam. In your humanity, there is not just beauty, beauty externally, but there are passions internally that are natural to your humanity. But with the fall of Adam, there was damage. And some of those passions have been distorted. And the appetites have been perverted. And then you unite that with a world in which you live that attract you to satisfy with no boundaries, no limitations, just satisfy and self-gratify. That's our culture. It's a drumbeat of it. Do what you want. Make yourself happy. If it feels good, do it. Everybody has a right to define their own truth and chase their own satisfactions. Tolerance is loving. You do what you want. I'll love who I want. I'll be how I want. And I organize this as a member of humanity under the idea that this is how God made me. Now, obviously, we have folks in our culture who don't believe God made anything, that they're the product of random chance and a lot of time. But most folks will, or many folks, will give credence to the idea that they're made, not evolved, despite what they learn. And housed even in the challenge of Christianity, in the culture of Christianity today, is this idea that if I have passions that are distorted, inconsistent with what the Word of God says I am by way of my identity, those passions are validating evidence that this is the way God made me, and I should live them out to be true to myself. The Bible does not support that understanding of reality. And James chapter 4 is an effort by the Apostle James, the head of the church at Jerusalem, to illuminate your understanding of your biggest challenge, both inwardly and outwardly, your greatest enemy, the influencer that is amplifying and seducing, tempting, accusing, promoting, things that are incongruous with the glory of God to be represented in the theater of this world in which you live and through the glory you display as an actor made by God for the glory of God. James chapter 4 is rich in relevance because it tells us our biggest challenge and our greatest enemy. James chapter 4, what is the source of quarrels and conflicts among you? Now just stop and look up for a minute. Quarrels and conflicts sound soft. I'm in a verbal argument, that's a quarrel. The Greek word actually has to do with a battle of words. A battle that's extreme and hurtful. This is not just, I'm in an argument with you. I'm in a verbal battle, and in that battle, I'm going to hurt you or you're going to hurt me. The word conflict is the word for war. It's an extended encounter or altercation. It's not just an explosive encounter that results in a war of words or a battle of words. It's a war that involves resentment, bitterness, and a desire to injure. I mean, if you look at our culture, one of the conclusions you have to draw is something is unbounded and uncovered at levels we've never witnessed. I mean, you have to ask yourself, what in the world is going on in a culture where you have lives so quickly taken, so radically impacted by anger and, you know, people shooting people and walking into Walmart or a place of business and shooting randomly, taking lives. You have abortion on demand. You have a world in which you take lives freely. A mother can kill her child. 
it's protected, it's promoted. And then you see the vitriolic anger in response when in some ways it seems to be inhibited. In other words, me protecting a life that might encumber my life justifies my anger if you require to protect and go through the, uh, the inconvenience and the difficulty of giving life or birth. It's a crazy culture. And a guy come back from the war zone in the Middle East, he came home. This is a soldier who survived the war, came home to return to Detroit, and he's murdered by his brother-in-law who was conspiring with his sister, the man's wife, in order to take his life in order to gain access to the insurance by which he was covered. Or a school teacher in New England seducing a teenager, convincing him to take the life of her husband so that she could gain gain ground financially. You have at a level never seen before conflict everywhere. And it's dark, it's angry, it's ugly, and it's not just in the world around you. It's in your homes, it's in your churches, it's in your communities, it's in your life. And James is saying, what is the source of that? Listen to this, conflict is on the rise both in and out of the family of God and both in and out of the families of men. Shelters for the abused are growing at alarming rate. More divorces will be filed this year than ever before on the grounds of physical or emotional abuse. More children will leave home this year than ever before on the grounds of physical, sexual, and emotional abuse. A recent study has suggested that one out of every four within the family of God have been or or are in the process of being abused. What is the cause for all of the anger, all of the injury, all of the conflict, all of the quarrels? What's the reason? That's what this is about. Because let me tell you something. James chapter 3 ends by saying, The fruit of righteousness is peace. James chapter 4 begins by saying, then why is there conflict among you? Watch what he says, chapter 4, verse 2. Is not the source your pleasures, hedonon, you hear the word hedonism in it, your pleasures that wage war in your members. Now, members can go two ways. In the community, the membership of the body of Christ, the family you live in, among the people group you're a part of, or internally, your body and the members that make you up, your nature is not the source of the conflict in you and around you, the consequence of this word called pleasure. Pleasure is the appetite for gratification and satisfaction. James says that's what's going on. There's an engine. There's a desire in you that motivates you, compels you to acquire something, to satisfy something no matter what the cost. And if it involves injuring someone else, I'm willing to do it. If if it involves taking a life, I'm willing to take it because I have this driving engine inside of me to be satisfied. Let me begin this way. A challenge you have and the world that we live in has is a pleasure problem. It's a pleasure problem for an appetite to self-gratify no matter what it costs someone else even their life, which is why he goes on to say in verse 2, you lust. Epithumia, it's this word, it's, it, when we read lust, it's inherently negative. And it can be negative. Contextually here, it is negative, but it has to do with passions you have. Thumas, you have passion, epi, amped up passions. You have strong desires. God built you with passions. But when those passions govern your life to the point that if you do not have it, you lust and you do not have, which means you want it, you can't acquire it. So what do you do? So you commit murder, which is the hyperbole statement to say, I'll take it even if it costs you a lot. That's how bad I want it. This passage 
is about self-satisfaction and the conflict that is driven by it, this strong desire. You are envious, verse 2, and you cannot obtain. Now, you know what envy is. They have it. You want it. You want what they have. You can't get it. Watch what it says, verse 3, so you fight and quarrel. They're withholding something they have. You don't want them to have it. You believe you need to get it, and therefore you're going to take it. You're going to fight for it. You're going to battle for it. And ultimately, if it means harming and injuring even their life, you will do it. And remember what Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5. You have heard it said, thou shalt not commit murder. But I say unto you, if you are angry with a brother... Or if you call them a blockhead or a bonehead or an idiot, you, you diminish them verbally. You are guilty before the Supreme Court. That's what I'm telling you. You cannot just injure their body. You can injure their heart. The engine is you want it, your pleasure. Now, just a few thoughts about pleasure before we continue. What does pleasure do? According to Luke chapter 8, verse 15, pleasure and the desire for riches choke the seed of the gospel. So my appetites and the priority I place on those appetites can choke the life of God in me. Actually, it can deny me access to the life of God. The seed doesn't produce fruit because it doesn't possess life. It's not fertilized with transactional grace and faith. Turn over with me to uh, Titus chapter 3. Let me just punctuate the problem with pleasure because I think if you don't understand the source, you don't address the issue. In your humanity, saved, transformed, there is a desire in your humanity for satisfaction, pleasure. And the pleasure can be distorted by the fall and distorted by the source that you leverage in order to acquire satisfaction. Titus chapter 3, just a reminder. Paul's talking about the way we ought to treat people. Verse 2, we're to malign no one. We're to be peaceable, gentle, showing every consideration for all men. That's how we ought to behave to a lost world. Why? Verse 3, and this is color commentary on who they are, but it reflects on who we used to be. To malign no one, verse 3, for we also were foolish ourselves, disobedient, deceived, now watch this, enslaved to various lusts and pleasures. Now watch what the lusts and pleasures and the slavery, the consuming self-life that is dominated by a desire to be satisfied, we spend our life in malice, envy, hateful, hating one another. This engine, I'm going to call it worldliness, this appetite in me that is unbounded by its desire to be satisfied, that I'm willing to take it if you have it, even at expense to you, and if you have it, I want it, and I'll fight with you or diminish you in order to get it. The problem is a pleasure problem a passion for self-gratification. And you know what it was before you were saved? Enslaving. You know what it can be as a Christian, undealt with, and we're going to deal with it in this passage? Enslaving. Part of the reason why your life can be so littered with broken relationships, arguments, injuries, division at home, or even here at the university, is a product of unbounded passions that have enslaved us into the belief that I have to have this, and I'll hate and hurt and injure if necessary to get it. Let me boil it all down at the beginning. Apologia. The lusts of the flesh, Peter says, wage war against your soul. 
They don't strengthen it. They damage it and diminish it. And the pleasures in us, this appetite for self-satisfaction, can cause us to lose our testimony because we don't live in a way, James says, that validates our faith. That's what's going on. Back to James chapter 2, or James chapter 4, rather. Second Peter says that you were released from the corrupting influence of pleasure and desire that is in the world has this rotting, rusting kind of capacity to injure and ruin you. So here's how it unfolds at the beginning in this section. We have a problem that promotes division and injury, conflict, quarrels, and hurtful, hateful behavior. And that problem is within us, our pleasures, unbounded, by the grace of God and the means that God has deployed to rightfully satisfy those desires. Look at verse 2 at the end. The reason why the fighting and the frustration is because a lack of satisfaction and the reason you're not satisfied is you do not have because you do not ask. Let me tell you what he just introduced. You are self-dependent. You are leveraging and exercising your own means and ways, justified self-centeredness, to acquire what it is you believe will satisfy your need, your heart, the justified gratification of the pleasures. But you're using your own tools and approaches instead of asking God who is the true source of satisfaction. Because as a Christian, you cannot self-satisfy. You can't acquire or eat enough or have enough in order to be satisfied in the ways that you hunger and long for. That's why the woman at the well, having had five husbands, Jesus said, if you knew, you would ask me, and I'll give you water, and you'll never thirst again, because you can have five rotations or iterations chasing your own satisfaction, and you're still thirsty. You're now living with a guy, not your husband. That's a commentary on our humanity. And what James is saying is the reason you're not satisfied is because you're not asking the one who is the source of your satisfaction. You are self-dependent, not God-dependent. You're a self-fixer. You're a self-acquirer. You're going to leverage assets in your world. You're going to leverage power. You're going to use words. You're going to do what it takes to get what you desire. And James says the reason you don't have it is the faulty method you're deploying in order to acquire it. You need to ask God. And then he goes on to say, verse 3, you ask and you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives. Some of your Bibles say you ask amiss. What do you mean wrong motives? Well, here it is, so that you may spend it on your pleasures, which is a bottom line way to say You're not only self-dependent, you are self-centered in your appetites and desires. It's about you. And as long as life is about you and your satisfactions, you can ask God all you want, and He will not supply what truly satisfies your soul. Because the end game of your Christianity, the transformation that's impactful, is when it's about God and others, not you. As a little boy, my mother used to say, Harry, joy is J-O-Y, Jesus, others, and then you. The only satisfaction and only true fulfillment you will ever enjoy is when your life is properly motivated. God first, Jesus, others, their needs, considering them as more important than yourself, and then you, 
at the end of that chain of priority, experience a joy and a satisfaction. Here's what James is saying. The reason you have trouble, you're driven by the passions that are about you and the satisfaction you desire. Instead of asking God and trusting God, you're relying on yourself. And you are asking in a way that demonstrates this is about self-satisfaction so that you may spend it. This literally in your pleasures. I want what I want in order to have what I need so I can be satisfied in that. Now look at verse 4. You adulteresses. You betrayers of a covenant. You violators of the most intimate relationship. I mean, it is a stunning statement that James chooses this this label, this, this name, this category that he says of those who say, we have been changed by faith. He's saying your life demonstrates in your self-interest and in your self-satisfaction, your self-reliance, that you're a betrayer of a covenant that is rightly yours with God. You adulteresses. He's not talking about physical unfaithfulness. He's talking about spiritual unfaithfulness. He's talking about betraying a relationship. Now, let me explain it this way. The adultery is this. Just what adultery is in a human relationship, a betrayal. A betrayal by seeking satisfaction with an illegitimate partner. It's what adultery is. It is the betrayal of a relationship by seeking satisfaction with an illegitimate partner. Now, who is the illegitimate partner? Who is it that you're seeking satisfaction through and by? Look at the rest of verse 4. Do you not know that friendship with the world is hostility toward God? Therefore, whoever wishes to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. The mistress is the world. The world is the asset source, the illegitimate partner that you engage in order to satisfy desires that you have. Remember, you're not asking, and you're not asking because you're not looking to God as the source, you're looking to the world as the source. And God calls that adulterous. Let me give you a definition of worldliness because if you want to boil down this sermon, it's the danger of worldliness. Worldliness is a perspective that prioritizes me, my desires, over God and His desires. And a pattern that picks the world over God. A life path and over God, we pick the world over God for our satisfaction of the desires that are inherent in our humanity. It's a life path. It's a way of living that partners with the world instead of partnering with God. Worldliness is an attitude expressed by activity that makes me, Harry, more important than God. My desires over his desires. A worldview that puts my pleasures and priority in the, in, in the primary place. This is the engine of a world in conflict. Dr. Horner talked about the illuminating thoughts of some of the classical writers. Listen to uh, Roman historian Philo. He points out that the Ten Commandments culminates with the forbidding of covetousness or desire because desire and the passion of the soul is the reason, he writes, that relations are broken. And this natural goodwill between men changed into desperate enmity The great and populous countries, says Philo, are desolated by domestic dissensions and land and sea filled with ever new disasters by naval battles and land campaigns. Wars famous in tragedy have all flowed from one source, desire. 
Plato writes, the sole cause of wars and revolutions and battles is nothing other than the body and its desires. Cicero writes, it is insatiable desire which overturn not only individual men but whole families and which even bring down the state. From desires there spring hatred, schisms, discord, seditions, and wars. Cicero concludes, desire is at the root of all the evils which ruin life and divide men. The heart of the challenge is the appetites and passions that are justified self-satisfactions and me leveraging the world in which I live and all of its offerings and solutions to satisfy those appetites. And God says, when you turn to a source that's not a source, that's adultery. It's the highest level of betrayal. Now listen, there's a reason why worldliness is a big deal. Because worldliness results in every human conflict you will have. And worldliness results in heavenly conflict. Because verse 4 says, this is hostility toward God. Hostility is a word which comes from the word hate. It's hateful toward God. When you pick the world as a solution and a self-satisfaction over relying on him and depending upon him, it's a betrayal. It undermines your faith. It wages war with it. And secondly, it undermines and damages and destroys your testimony. There is no defense of a gospel that is invalidated by the priorities reflected in its truth. Adultery. Turn over with me to, uh, I'm going to show you a couple of passages I think give you some vivid color. This is Jeremiah chapter 2. Prophet Jeremiah is writing to a people group, the covenant people of God. He's going to use the same imagery. Because God thinks he's the husband of the people of God. He refers to himself in Isaiah 54, 5, for your husband is your maker, whose name is the Lord of hosts. Your redeemer is the Holy One of Israel, who is called the God of all the earth. He considers himself a jealous, zealous for this relationship husband. In the New Testament, Christ is the groom. We're the bride of Christ. We're in this this marriage-like covenant relationship. Jeremiah is the prophet writing to the people of God because God is talking about the injury and the impact and the hurt that he experiences when his people betray him with an alternative source other than him. Verse 16, chapter 1, God says, I will pronounce my judgments on them, a reference to his idolatrous people, on them concerning all their wickedness, whereby they have forsaken me and have offered sacrifices to other gods and worshiped the works of their own hands. They've abandoned me and they've betrayed me. They've chosen things not me. Grant talked about it on Monday, exchanging the glory of God for something not God. That's what they were doing. God gives them over to a reprobate mind, to futility. Whenever you exchange God for something not God, it's adulterous, it is idolatrous, and listen to me, it's injurious. And it's not just injurious to you and the human beings around you, but it's injurious to God who is in a relationship with you. Chapter 2, he he flavors it out. This is the first of 13 oracles in the book of Jeremiah. It is one of the saddest and richest colorful commentaries on the way God sees what we do when we pick a suitor who is not God. Now the word of God came, chapter 2, verse 1. The word of the Lord came to me, that's Jeremiah, saying, Go and proclaim in the ears of Jerusalem, thus says the Lord, I remember concerning you the devotion of your youth. 
Devotion has to do with a Hebrew word which means your covenant commitment. It's not just a betrothal. It's a commitment to be married. And he goes on to say the devotion of your youth, the love of your betrothals. That's the vows to be faithful. I remember that. How you were devoted to me and how you were committed to me and how you followed me like a husband. You're following after me in the wilderness through a land not sown. Israel, the people in whom he was in relationship, was holy to the Lord. That is to say they are exclusively his because a wife is exclusively the husband's. The first of his harvest, the priority, all who ate of it became guilty. Evil came upon them, declares the Lord. In other words, if you took what belonged to me, there were consequences to those who would take it because I'm a jealous husband. Hear the word of the Lord, O house of Jacob, and all the families of the house of Israel. Thus says the Lord, Yahweh, what injustice did your fathers find in me that they went far from me and walked after emptiness and became empty? Let me tell you what God is saying. Why did they abandon me? What did I do wrong that would motivate them to betray this relationship we were sharing in betrothal covenant love? What did I do? Verse 6, they did not say, where is the Lord? In other words, I didn't abandon them. When did I abandon you? I'm the one who brought you up, verse 6, out of the land of Egypt who led us up through the wilderness, through a land of deserts and of pits, through a land of drought and of deep darkness, through a land that no one crossed and where no man dwelt. I brought you into the faithful land to eat its fruit and its good things. In other words, I led you like a husband would lead you. I cared for you. I valued you. I protected you. I didn't abandon you. I led you. I provided for you. What did I do wrong that you choose some Something not me. Verse 7, but you came and defiled my land and my inheritance you made an abomination. Why? Through their idolatry, their worldly pursuit of self-satisfaction through something not God. Verse 8, the priests, these are the indictment of the three leader groups. The priests did not say, where is the Lord? And those who handle the law did not know me. The rulers who transgressed against me and the prophets prophesied by Baal and walked after things that did not profit. The people that should have shepherded you didn't shepherd you. I don't understand that is what God is saying. They are legally accountable, verse 9. Therefore, I will contend. I will yet contend. That's a legal term. I'll call them into a, a court, a legal indictment. I'll contend with you, declares the Lord, Yahweh. And with your sons' sons, I will contend. This is not right, is what he's saying. For cross to the coastlands of Katim and see, that's all the way to the west, and send to Kedar and observe closely all the way to the east and see if there has been such a thing as this. In other words, look around the world and you will find, no matter how far you look that way or how far you look this way, verse 11, has a nation changed gods than when they when they were not gods, but my people have changed their glory for that which does not profit. Now, I want you to look at verse 12. Be appalled, O heavens, at this, and shudder. Be very desolate, declares Yahweh. Let me tell you what that is. Let the heavens and all the world display the deep consternation and the deep uh, painful impact and emotion that I have. I want the world I created to display how appalling that kind of a betrayal is. Remember what James called it? It's adultery. It's the deepest level of betrayal. And I want the heavens to be appalled because I'm deeply moved and injured by that action. Verse 13, what did they do? Here's the bottom line on worldliness. My people have committed two evils. Number one, they have forsaken me. That's abandonment. The fountain of living water. Number two, to dig for themselves or hew for themselves cisterns, broken cisterns that can hold no water. 
They've left me the source of life, the fountain of living water, the spring that is pure. To dig for themselves, you know what a cistern is? A cistern is a water pot that catches runoff water. Runoff water is polluted by the soil when it gets to the pot. So they've traded what is pure for what is polluted. And not only that, they've traded what was capable of satisfying for a vessel that was broken. It couldn't hold it. So even the polluted water, you couldn't keep it. Worldliness is treating God as if he's not the solution for your satisfaction. And instead, you pick a worldly resource. You become a friend, an associate, a companion. You become allies with. You take interest in the world, which is the cosmos governed by the God of this world. 1 John chapter 2 says, the lust of the eyes, that's the lust of the flesh rather, that's passions. The lust of the eyes, that's possessions. The pride of life, that's position. All that is in the world, the promotion of self-satisfaction for passions that are satisfied, possessions acquired, or positions I achieve. You have become a friend of the world, and you have chosen, instead of me, the source of living, living water, you have chosen a vehicle that can't give it, nor can it hold it. And you know what I call that? Unfaithful. And it's hurtful. And it's hateful. Verse 4, hostility toward God. And he, look at what it says, verse 4. Go all the way back to James chapter 4. Whoever wishes, do you see the word wishes? When you choose, verse 4, to be a friend of the world, you hang with them, you partner with them, you look to the media, you look to their solutions, their satisfactions for your satisfactions. When you're a friend with the world, you are choosing to become an enemy of God, which means you're his adversary. You know what will destroy your faith as, it's, as an influence? Is being worldly and behaving in a way that says the world in which I live, by the way I live, is the source of my satisfaction. I become an adversary of God. I become a hurtful betrayer to God. And that is hateful toward God. Let me illustrate. If I live in the Ukraine today, Russia's bombing, destroying, we're at war. The level of injury, the level of heartache, the level of loss is incalculable. And if you're in the middle of it and you lose family and collateral damage and you see the, the injury and the boundless hurtfulness of one country wanting, wanting, wanting what another country has, you live there. That's your nation. That's your family. Those are your friends. That's your community. Imagine walking into a home of a friend, a fellow Ukrainian, and you walk into their home and there's a picture of Putin and there is pictures on the wall and books on the table and videos on the screen that promote the, the glories of Russia. The sounds are Russian. The priorities are Russian. What would you be considered? Not a friend or a faithful citizen of the Ukraine, you would be considered an enemy of your own people and country. Because what's playing and what's seen and what's promoted, the culture that you are attracted to or engaged with, the dress that you wear, it's Russian, not Ukrainian. That's the Christian who plays the media of the world, 
who saturates on the things of the world with the values of the world, acquiring the desires of the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life. That Christian has become by choice looking to those solutions, not the fountainhead, but the broken cistern, an enemy and an adversary and a hurtful injury relationally to God. And you know what that does to your faith? It destroys its influence. And you know what it does to your heart? It ruins and damages the strength of your faith. It wages war in you. So it's not just a conflict with the world around you. It's not just conflict with heaven and God above you. It is conflict within you. Let me finish with verse 5. And six, do, verse five is going to tell you why this matters so much to God, or it's going to tell you why it's such a challenge for you. This is one of the hardest verses in the Bible to interpret exegetically. My Bible, the New American Standard, the LSB, and reads this way, or do you think that the Scripture speaks to no purpose? Now, this is the general revelation of Scripture. There's no verse in the Bible that says this. So, what James is saying, when you look back at the content of Scripture, does it not reveal this reality? Verse 5, he, that's capital H, this is one way to take it, he, God, that would be God, that's the subject, jealously desires the Spirit, capital S, that would be the Holy Spirit, which he has made to dwell in us. Now, if verse 5 is properly translated in the NESB or the translation you have, and it sounds like this, it is giving you the reason why worldliness is so hurtful to God. Because God jealously desires the Holy Spirit that He has placed within you. And when you live in a worldly way, you threaten that communion. That's one way to take it. The ESV reads a little differently. It says, he desires, verse 5, jealously desires the little less, the spirit, the human spirit that he has made to dwell within us. The ESV would say, basically, God's jealous for the human spirit he has created and placed in you for communion. The King James, and I think the preferable translation based on the language would sound like this, verse 5, we jealously envy through the spirit, human spirit, which he has made to dwell in us. Our, let me translate it, not literally, but so you understand it, the human spirit he has placed within us, jealously, passionately, envies and longs for satisfaction from the world around us, which is an explanation not of why this hurts God so bad, but why this is so hard for me. Because in my humanity, my fallen humanity, I have a spring-loaded default position to desire satisfaction. I want what I don't have, and I want it from a source that I can see not from the God who I cannot see. You wonder why you're not living the way you ought to live? Because you get up every morning with an appetite for self-satisfaction and solutions that are not God, and that's natural to you. And you get up in the morning, and you bow your knees, submit your heart, and you say, God, I'm spring-loaded, to betray. I'm spring-loaded to argue and fight. I need help today. I need grace to overcome my inherent weakness. And God, I don't want to hurt you. I want to be faithful to you. Which is why verse 6 says, but he gives greater grace despite my big challenge. Verse 6 says, God gives greater grace, and he gives, he's opposed to the proud, the person who's seeking satisfaction on their own, but he gives grace to the humble. 
who are the humble, those who desperately say, I can't live in a way that honors you. I am prone to self-satisfaction even with an altercation or somebody else's destruction. I'm inclined to dig water pots that can't hold water. I want to drink. I'm so thirsty. And instead of waiting and asking and looking, I tend to betray. And I need help. I desperately need help. Masters University, this passage is thick with relevance and richness that basically says, I'm your source, don't trade me for a world in which you live, befriending it and abandoning me. Trust me for the grace that I will bestow on the humble. Submit to God, resist the devil, draw near to God, he will draw near to you. Clean your hands, purify your heart, Weep and mourn instead of joyfully following along as if you're in a party with no consequences. Really repent. And verse 10 says, humble yourselves in the presence of the Lord that way and he'll exalt you. He'll exalt what? Your position, your place, your influence, the honor he will bestow on you because you're a faithful friend of God, not a fickle friend who pursues the world. Father, thank you for the opportunity to open your word today. And Lord, I thank you for just the challenge that your words give and the relevance of your revelation to our reality. Lord, some of us are constantly challenged with discord and division. And would you help us to diagnose properly and adjust spiritually so that we can pray and seek trust and follow, humble and wait so the Lord, we can taste fountainhead life, not polluted, not empty, not Twinkies, but nourishment from above. That's my prayer for us all, and I ask it in Jesus' name. And God's people said, amen.